Hello, I'm Alice Richardson. I'm a biostatistician and a lover of music. This talk will begin with a song to set the scene. Follow the link to experience the song. And the real title of this talk I can now reveal, Mamma Mia! The Evidence for Block Voting in the Eurovision Song Contest. Before we get on to the data used to address the research question, I think it's time for another song. It is becoming better known that Australians have competed in Eurovision long before Guy Sebastian stormed on stage in 2015. Here's Australian singer Olivia Newton-John singing for Britain in 1974, up against ABBA and Waterloo for Sweden. I guess she never really stood a chance. Follow the link to experience the song. And so on to the data. The Dutch researchers focused on the years 1975 to 2003, during which time the voting rules were pretty stable, although televoting was introduced from 1997. They also restricted the analysis to countries that participated at least three times in that 29 year period. Countries have always come and gone from the final two dozen or so that appear in the final, and 36 countries met the criteria. These images remind us that the winner at the start of this period, 1975, the contest was in Sweden and the winning song was the Dutch Dingaling. And in 2003, the contest was in Latvia and the winning song was the Turkish Every Way That I Can. The researchers defined voting bias like this. Bias is the difference between the points that a jury I gives to song J and the average number of points assigned to song J by the other juries. So for example, Greece has assigned seven points to Russia here and the bias would be the difference between the seven and the average score that Russia gets from all the other juries. Using the difference and the average allows for the overall quality of a song, the idea that some songs are just destined to score high and some low. The variables the researchers used to try and explain the bias are going to be geography, religion, ethnicity, language, culture and performance. Geography will be operationalized as two measurements, one, the difference in latitude north-south, and the other, the difference in longitude east-west, between two countries. The capital city is used as the measuring point for each country. So for example, here's London, the capital of Great Britain, and Madrid, the capital of Spain. The difference in latitude is this distance here, and the difference in longitude is this distance. Religion will be operationalized via tick the box yes no variables. Each European country was allocated a major religion from this list Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Jewish, Muslim, and Protestant. The religion box gets a tick if two countries share their major religion. For example, Spain is a Catholic country, Great Britain a Protestant country, so no tick there. Ethnicity will be operationalized in a way that will try to capture the idea of the Western diaspora from the earlier slide, the idea that many Turkish people have migrated to Western Europe, but still retain a soft spot for their country's music. The researchers decided that countries with a substantial Turkish population were basically these ones in red, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, and the UK. Language will be operationalized by the delightful concept of lexico-statistical distance between countries' languages. This image here is of the division of European languages into two main groups, Latin-based languages like French and Italian, Germanic-based languages like German, Swedish and even English, and then other smaller groups like Greek and Celtic-based. So basically, countries that speak languages in the same family, like France and Italy, will get a small distance, but countries that speak languages that are very different, like Israel and Russia, will get a large distance. Culture captures the notion of pride in your country's language by a tick-the-box variable for whether a particular song from a particular country in a particular year was in the Eurovision languages of French or English. Most songs are. 
but there's often a discussion about a country's decision to sing in their own language rather than English or French. Performance captures a couple of other aspects of the competition that are generally thought to be important. The nature of the performance group, solo, duet or group as you see here, the order of performance and whether your country is hosting the contest. So now that the response, bias and the predictor variables, geography, religion, ethnicity, language, culture and performance are all sorted, we can look at the researcher's model. They discuss a sequence of regression models in their paper, which are basically all of this form. The predicted bias is made up of an underlying mean amount, plus little bits associated with each of the predictor variables just mentioned. All up, there are 19 predictor variables. But before we bring you the results, another song. Follow the link to experience the winner of the 2015 Eurovision contest. Wasn't that a fantastic song? The 2015 juries and televoters certainly thought so. But what of the evidence for voting bias? Let's go through one variable at a time. Geography was found to have a significant effect on voting patterns, so it is true that countries close together tend to vote for one another. The effect was found to be strongest for the grouping of Austria, Estonia, Germany, Macedonia and Turkey through Middle Europe here. Religion was found to have a significant effect on voting patterns, but in varying directions. So Bosnia, a Muslim country, tended to vote for non-Muslim countries. But Cyprus, Iceland, Ireland, Latvia and the UK tended to vote for countries with the same major religion. Ethnicity was found to have a significant effect on voting patterns. So it is true that the Turkish migrant populations tend to vote patriotically, supporting their country of origin, not their country of residence. And finally, none of language, culture or performance were found to have a significant effect on voting patterns. So there was no evidence about closely related language groups or the language of the song or the nature of the group or the performance order or being the host None of these had a statistically significant effect on voting bias. That's a lot of myths busted in one simple slide. The last thing the researchers did was to try to deal with the urban myths around the existence of particular voting blocks. So here are five of the classic mythical blocks that the researchers looked at and whether they found evidence for their existence or not. The Baltic block, some evidence of voting bias here. The former Yugoslav bloc, some evidence, pretty weak, mostly centred around Slovenia and Macedonia. The Scandinavian bloc, some evidence, mostly through the culture variables. The UK Ireland bloc, no statistical evidence, though every year viewers feel that UK votes for Ireland and vice versa, mostly because of the unmentioned myth that no one else votes for the UK at all. Finally, the Hellenic bloc. Solid evidence that Greece and Cyprus showed voting bias, but it's mostly through the language and religion variables, and it's not the only pair of countries with similarly strong evidence. So in conclusion, I hope you can see that it takes a lot of careful thought and definition and statistical modelling to prove or disprove a Eurovision myth. But let's not forget that Eurovision is supposed to be fun, in particular don't forget to pick up your bingo cards when you settle down in front of the TV. I'm sure we all wish Dummy M the best of luck, because in the end, it's only a game. And to close, another song, of course, proving that some countries definitely treat Eurovision as a game. This is the song generally thought to be the worst Eurovision song ever, the German entry from 1998 by Gildo. Enjoy. Follow the link to experience the song.